Hey, everybody. Rob uh, Califf here. And uh, it's great to uh, hear all this, especially since I had the uh, privilege of working closely with the Cersei program when I was uh, commissioner. And I think this uh, organization has really done a great job of the real purpose, which is the science that undergirds uh, the regulatory system and how it should work. And I, I was really thrilled to see to hear about the five projects. Janet, as usual, gave a very clear presentation um, of what needs to be done. And we'll get back to it. But my my question, Janet, was really, um, OK, we know the problem. I don't actually think there's much debate about the solution to the evidence generation system. It's just that no one's in charge. And so we keep talking about the problems and the solutions, but um, it doesn't happen. We'll get back to that because I think it's uh, pertinent not only to uh, pandemic situations. It's like a lot of what was in your slide for solutions, for example, was in the pandemic playbook that was um, put together over a decade as um, systems were being put into place, but it just wasn't quite done, I think largely because um, we have so much fragmentation in the system. So um, that really leads us into the panel. And what we decided to do for this panel was to um, really take into account that we're in a situation where we uh, do recognize that we need to speed up therapeutics in the setting of a pandemic but we also need to deal with the therapeutic situation and all of infectious disease, particularly um, issues with bacteria and viruses where um, uh, the incentives are not quite in place to make things work perhaps the way they should. Um, and I would extend it beyond that to say that if we just look at common chronic disease right now, um, I, I liken what's happening with the pandemic to a tsunami situation. There's an earthquake that's happened uh, called the pandemic, but the waves that are going to be experienced over the next six to 12 months have a lot to do with bread and butter, common chronic disease, where we have a real deficit right now in uh, new therapeutics because uh, the system is not efficient the costs of development are growing um, and incentives are not in place, but yet we can't incentivize everything. So we've got a great panel that's going to give us um, the answers as to what should be done. And then based on the questions that Janet got, I'm sure we'll fill all the time with really interesting uh, things to talk about. And I'm going to do a brief introduction of each panelist and then uh, each of them will take their favorite solution to the problem and talk about it briefly, and then we'll open it up to the panel. So on this panel, we've got uh, Diana Brainard, who's Senior Vice President um, at Gilead and has done tremendous work, particularly in the area of virology, but has a much broader view of the industry. George Skangos, uh, President and CEO of Vera Biotechnology, uh, diligently working in this space, also with a great span of experience. Um, Peter Kim, uh, former head of, and president of MRL, uh, so very broad experience in uh, the research domain. Now uh, back at Stanford as professor of biochemistry. And then uh, the person I don't see is Denise Hinton, who's supposed to be with us on the panel. So hopefully we'll find Denise and make sure she gets, um, she gets connected. Ah, there she is. Okay, now I see you. Fantastic. <laughs> And I love the uh, I love the uniform. I, I've all you know since I've spent time at the FDA, I was all, always jealous that I couldn't get a uniform because I was not um, part of the uniform service. And Denise is a chief scientist at FDA. Um, also to be acknowledged here is Brooke Byers, who was originally part of this but wanted to be in the audience, um, uh, but put forward some ideas which you're going to um, hear about during the Q and A section. So Diana, I'll turn to you first and um, really interested in what your perspective is here. 
Thanks, Rob, and um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to participate. This is my first Circe meeting, and, and um, I'm really excited about the agenda and already um, enjoyed hearing from Janet. And I mean, I, I think I would just start with a note of optimism. Um, there, there have been a, a huge number of lessons learned, um, and I think they're well articulated by, by Janet, and there are many others. But at the same time, uh, there have been some tremendous accomplishments, not the least of which is the development and rollout of a vaccine uh, in a year in a space where typical timelines have been traditionally measured in, in decades um, uh, in terms of leveraging uh, prior expertise and knowledge to bring antibodies to bear and, and to market and to clinical trials quickly. And, and then of course, in the field of antivirals and um, getting treatments into the hands of physicians and doctors that, that do work and do help reduce morbidity. Um, so I, I, there are bright spots there and places to focus on what has gone right. And I think, I think where, uh, where we've done really well is this all in approach from industry and from investigators and in particular from FDA to say, let's work very collaboratively. And I would say that um, we've always had a within the um, uh, Gilead and in virology, a very close uh, collaboration with FDA, but, but, but in this context of an unknown disease, um, it was really taken to a new level in terms of um, really learning from each other and learning from the community as data were rolling out to inform what decisions we're making next. And I think there, if we think about going forward into how can these lessons be applied outside of the pandemic um, to other infectious diseases and even beyond that, um, I think that that spirit of collaboration will be very important. And it's important because one of the big barriers to um, uh, going into diseases where there either are no approved therapies or um, the regulatory path un is unclear is the regulatory risk. And this regulatory risk is different from the other big risk, which is the risk around not understanding the etiology of a disease. And, and you can see that there with Alzheimer's or with NASH and that creating a, a high level of risk. But in infectious diseases and in other areas such as pediatric oncology, for example, there can be much more understood about the targets and what you're going for. And there the path can be more in a sense of, do we know where we're going? And when companies know what to expect from the FDA, then that enables treatments to come forth more quickly and that sort of greases the, the wheels, so to speak. And so I think if we wanna pick some diseases that we can all collectively, FDA, patient community groups, investigators and academics, and say, these are top priorities for us. And then say, okay, do the standard placebo randomized controlled trials work? And if they don't, let's outline what that development path looks like. And let's do it in advance of having a specific molecule in mind so that everybody has got an equal voice and an equal playing field. Then there are other places where there are no currently approved ther ther uh, therapies like you know, virgin territory and whether that's viral associated hemorrhagic cystitis or norovirus um, or uh, rare uh, 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 rheumatologic conditions coming together and saying, these are the diseases that we're going to try to really make an effort to elicit therapies from, and this is how companies can do it. Um, and then I think revisiting some of the development paths. So for example, with multidrug resistant antibiotics, this is a place where there have been incentives put in place, but those incentives are really focused on the early research. And so companies can get funding to do some of this work but that doesn't um, uh, you know, preclude the potential for really large late stage failures. And I think plazomycin is just a recent example of a, a compound that seemed to show a lot of promise and excitement, um, but then it all, it all sort of um, 
never really came together at the end and, and it stands as a cautionary tale. And so I think being able to put out what, what are the lessons learned there and then how can we come together and work around that is going to be, be very important. Um, so again, I would just say prospectively defining the clinical development path and, and you can't do that for every disease. So collectively determining, you know, what are the top 10 in each therapeutic area and, and can we really focus there? I think that can make a difference. Thanks, Anna. That's uh, that's a great uh, starter. I have a bunch of questions myself, but we'll, uh, we'll go through the whole panel and then we'll get to the panel discussion. Um, George, you're, you're up next. Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, and uh, thank you, Jen, for the great introduction. I think uh, you touched on some really important issues. I, and uh, what what Jan has said about uh, so many trials uh, is is absolutely true, and they're plugging up the system. Uh, and it's not just uh, competition for patients. The CROs are overburdened. Uh, there's been a shortage of supplies that you need to do the assessment on patients. And so this is really an issue that uh, goes beyond just the fact that some of the trials are underpowered and inadequately controlled. Um, so, but that comes from the same enthusiasm that's led so quickly to vaccines and therapeutics getting to the market, which is there's a pandemic, people want to do something. You understand so little about the disease at the beginning. And you may know, for example, lung inflammation is likely to be important. You've got some compound that can modulate uh, lung inflammation and you want to test it. And that makes sense at the beginning, but there's so many ways to intervene and inflammation is a complicated process. Uh, and so it's inevitable that many of those early trials, even if they are adequately conducted, uh, will fail. Uh, and as we, as time goes on and we learn more about the, the biology of the virus and the biology of the disease, I think the, uh, the success rate uh, is likely to increase. What I wanted to, to talk about though, is that for many diseases, the desirable outcomes um, uh, affect um, in, uh, aspects of the disease that are rare, but they occur in large populations. So cumulative, there are a lot of them. So if you think about, um, let's say, um, infections after joint replacement surgery, so uh, that they occurred about 1%, uh, but there are so many joint replacements now that that leads to tens of thousands of infections every year. Um, those infections are serious. They cause revision surgeries. Uh, some patients never recover from those infections actually. So how do you do a clinical trial that is designed to reduce the incidence of something that occurs at a 1% level? I think an analogous uh, thing might be toxicity, you know, where you see rare toxicities. So the fact that you'd have to do a, you know, a huge trial, an expensive trial to show a reduction in a 1% incidence, and the fact that one, if your drug does work, it will benefit one patient for every hundred that take it. Uh, and so the, the price of that drug will be limited. Those two things just prevent development of drugs that will do that. Same is true for flu, right? The, the issue for flu is not really, do you get the flu and you get an upper respiratory tract infection and symptoms, but do you get a lower respiratory tract infection that causes a hospitalization and, and death? So that also is about a 1%. So how can we think about doing trials that would allow us to address those types of, of, of issues? So I think one, one proposal or one thought would be uh, to do a tightly controlled, rigorous trial of say a few thousand patients, two, three, 4,000 patients to look at safety, right? To make sure the drug is uh, acceptable, has an acceptable safety profile. Uh, it would generate a little bit of efficacy data, but certainly nothing statistically significant. And then um, on that basis, one could, uh, let's say provisionally approve the drug it, you could then assess its activity on 100,000 patients if you did a center randomized trial. So kind of a post um, preliminary approval way to look at things. So that would uh, allow, I think the development of therapeutics 
that can address those types of issues. So as we think about infectious diseases more broadly, I think those are, those are key issues that we need to come to grips with, or else we're gonna have, uh, continue to have, you know, tens of thousands of people die from flu, tens of thousands of people get uh, joint infections after, after their replacement. We should be able to do something about those things. Great, thanks, George. That was uh, concise and to the point. And just so that I don't forget it, I'm I'm uh, very excited to get Janet's opinion about two things related to this. Um, you know, when we get into the panel discussion on Diana's talk, the role of FDA guidance, and I, I have some specific views on that. But I think Janet knows that. I hope uh, will play out because if there's going to be. Um, uh, clear expectations. There has to be a place where it's written down so people know what it is. And then George has really brought up the progressive approval concept in one way or another. And Janet, you've had so much experience with the accelerated approvals in other areas. The uh, pluses and minuses are going to be important. But let's let's go on now to uh, Peter Kim, who's uh, just about seen it all. And I think, Peter, you may have had the most radical proposal for what needs to be done. <laughs> Um, but I think it, I think it uh, is very interesting. It's not new, but it may be the right time. Thank you, Rob. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. And I think that, and to hear the uh, talks, I, I just want to start by echoing what Janet said. Um, Diana also mentioned this. It's really uh, remarkable what's happened in the past year. It's uh, unprecedented and really a testimony to uh, the power of science and what we can do as a uh, research community if we come together to address a problem. Uh, it, uh, who would have guessed that one year ago, what, who would have guessed that we'd now have a vaccine uh, to address this pandemic? It's really, it's really wonderful. Uh, I, as I reflected back on the question here about um, issues that underlie uh, the development of new products for um, infectious disease, as Rob said, I actually thought back to a old problem, a long-standing problem, but one which I fear is not getting enough attention. Uh, and that is that really the um, upcoming crisis, and I think it's not an exaggeration to say that there really is an upcoming crisis that's going to result if developing new antibiotics uh, continues to be such an unfavorable financial proposition for companies. Uh, there are others on the panel and uh, in the audience who uh, know the statistics behind this much better than I do, but it's been very clearly evident that over the past few years, it's very been, been very clearly demonstrated that if a company goes out and develops and sets out to develop a new antibiotic that that's actually a negative net present value proposition. It's a, it actually creates a negative NPV situation. And the further the company goes in terms of getting closer to regulatory approval for a new antibiotic, the more negative the NPV actually becomes. And it's been really, um, I think, really disheartening to see that upon approval, uh, these companies have, and this has been clearly demonstrated, several of these companies actually end up going out of business. Uh, so <laughs> here we are faced with uh, bacteria in hospitals that are killing patients because we don't have antibiotics that can address the drug resistant uh, antimicrobial, uh, we don't have drug resistant antimicrobials to address these uh, bacteria and uh, the prospect of developing new antibiotics is actually financially uh, devastating. And so uh, I thought that for the panel, I would just raise the issue again. It's, as Rob said, not a new issue, but it's a very important issue. And uh, following on George's comments, you know, one option to think about is how one can deal with this in terms of the regulatory uh, approval process. And I think the notion of provisional approval and uh, Rob, as you mentioned, Brooke Byers has some interesting thoughts in this uh, arena in addition to what George said, but what can we do at the regulatory level 
to make it so that this is uh, something that's a better prospect for companies. But then I also think that this pandemic has uh, brought to bear a very, very interesting uh, new angle, which is that in the case of the pandemic, the federal government actually provided a way to remove the financial risk for vaccine uh, uh, production for COVID-19. By pre-purchasing vaccines it, 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 to the tune of many billions of dollars, the government actually removed significant financial risk from these companies and said that even if the vaccine doesn't work, we're prepaying for a uh, vaccine, so we've removed the financial risk. And that actually, uh, I think, is a very is very interesting food for thought about this issue that I'm discuss discussing. And so that leads me to then to the final comment that I'll make, and that is that uh, I personally feel that legislation is needed here to address the uh, upcoming crisis that we're having with with the uh, lack of development of, of antibacterial agents. And that uh, there are different ways that one could think about how legislation could be enacted here. Uh, and without going into those details, I'd be happy to have the panel discuss that. Just propose that in the same way that the government has done something about uh, making sure that vaccines for COVID-19 get developed, uh, the government could uh, do something to make sure that uh, antimicrobial agents uh, continue to be developed so that we can uh, hopefully avoid this upcoming crisis. And I'll stop there for now. Thanks, Peter. Wow, this is like a dream panel. You guys are concise to the point on time and each one has raised like a major issue that we could talk about for an hour at the time. Uh, so let's go to uh, Denise now. And Denise has already tipped me off. She's gonna talk about one of my favorite topics, at least a little bit, One Health, which is something that um, I'm amazed how few people even have thought about it. but very important. Denise. No, thank you, Rob. I, I appreciate the time today, your interest in One Health and also in this uniform. <laughs> um, I told you we could, before that we could always get you an honorary one if you'd like. So um, one of the things is, um, you know, as I want to just address today is like, um, there are many lessons that we have learned and, you know, we'll, we'll continue to learn from this COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, there, you know, some will be highlighted throughout the course of the summit today. I know that we have other um, colleagues and the like from the agency that will be um, speaking today, um, as well as from academia and industry. And I think some will be highlighted through the course, you know, uh, of the pandemic. I mean, Janet just spoke to what we are doing at Warp Speed and others, of course, have mentioned areas to accelerate progress. So I think... For me, another system change to accelerate progress in preventing and treating infectious disease is continued proactive collaboration across stakeholders. You know, as we know, multiple stakeholders with varied perspectives, agendas, and expertise came to the table to work together to react to this pandemic. That's positive. Um, and this is not the only time we've seen this occur. Um, it's just this is, a, you know, a, a very unprecedented time. So there's unprecedented things we need to do and continue to do. Um, and which going way back, I would say, for instance, in the late 80s with the AIDS epidemic, um, FDA implemented new regulations for drugs intended to, to treat um, life-threatening and severely debilitating illnesses. And these reg regulations focused on an entire drug development and evaluation process from early preclinical and clinical testing through FDA evaluation of controlled clinical trials and marketing applications, all the way to post-marketing surveillance, things we still have to think about today. Um, we have examples of the benefits of this proactive collaboration by having the early engagement with the FDA to, to foster and expedite drug development. Um, and for example, Janet mentioned FDA's breakthrough therapy designations, which is um, as we know, intended to expedite the development and review of drugs for serious or life-threatening conditions and provides those that receive the designation more intensive FDA guidance on an efficient drug development program. Um, it provides organizational commitment involving senior managers across the agency and then um, eligibility for rolling review and priority review. 
I think the point here is that by proactively working together, we achieve more. And we also learned from our experiences with H1N1, Zika, Ebola, that proactive collaboration is critical. We often have to be reactive when you're running into unprecedented times, but we have the opportunities from lessons learned to be proactive and we should. Um, I think uh, proactive collaboration has been key to FDA's medical countermeasure initiatives. Um, you know, that work to develop tools, standards, and approaches to assess medical countermeasures, safety, efficacy, quality, and performance, and to help translate cutting edge science and technology into innovative, safe, and effective medical countermeasures. I think what we must take from these examples that resulted from um, significant public health crises is the need to work in this collaborative manner proactively and not reactively. I think each of our panelists have said this today as well as Dear Hom and of course Janet. Um, we need to identify areas of unmet need and address them before they become crises. We need to take the lessons learned and work with that same sense of urgency and collaboration on the challenging problems we are facing as much as possible before they occur. And I think also, and to Peter's point, making sure that we find these mechanisms that, you know, in, that increase net present value um, to incentivize antibiotic development and to help avoid the upcoming um, crisis. I think this is incredibly important. Um, proactive collaboration is also important when we talk about representation in clinical trials, as Janet mentioned. FDA has long work to advance diverse participation in clinical trials from hosting public meetings, developing tools, and issuing guidance documents. Um, and I will say with the most recent final guidance um, it, that was issued just in November, which was on enhancing the diversity of clinical trial populations, eligibility criteria, enrollment practices, and trial designs. And what we need to do is really come together from lessons learned and thinking about how to ensure people from in the different and varying communities can participate in these trials and make it possible for them to do so. I think another area that needs more proactive collaboration is in the area of One Health. Um, this is, you know, uh, you know, this is a collaborative, multi-sectoral, and trans um, transdisciplinary approach to achieving optimal health outcomes by working at the local, regional, national, global levels. You know, we recognize that the health of people, animals, and the environment are interdependent, so we need to be focused on that. In recent years, um, One Health has assumed far greater importance as certain factors have altered interactions among people, animals, and our environment, which have led to the emergence and re-emergence of many diseases like influenza, Ebola, and now the coronavirus, which has unleashed the global COVID-19 pandemic. You know, I say a One Health platform enables us to develop stronger relationships, exchange educational experience with other federal agencies, further public and global um, health, break down silos and resolve issues with a systemic focus as we've been discussing here today. Um, proactive collaboration in this area will help us to learn more about the course of the disease as a global effort to identify the organism at the infectious phase. I think in summary, and what is needed, you know, is proactive collaboration amongst leaders in academia, industry, federal government, patient community groups, as was mentioned, which is at the foundation of the CIRCES, you know. So CIRCES do provide opportunities to explore and focus on addressing problems that range from emerging diseases to chronic conditions by proactively working together, which is what is continuously gonna be necessary as we plan and prepare for the next unknown public health crisis. So I'm gonna end there, but I, I, I do wanna also just take the time to thank you know, thank the UCSF Coordinating Committee for today's summit. And then I wanna thank you and then also my colleagues for their participation and contributions to this important program and to the discussions today. Thank you. Great, well, Denise, that was tremendous. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't just note in this uh, past week, um, the value of federal employees, I think is so underrepresented or uh, um, often misunderstood by the public. And I think you're a great example of someone who's put in uh, many years of great work and still going at it. So uh, we should we should all acknowledge, um, and, and it's come out in this panel, um, that the federal workforce is an essential part of getting anything done uh, in this country and often uh, at, at great uh, sacrifice. 
So with that, I, you know, I would say there were five big ideas that came out. None of them were new, but they're very pointed. And, um, you know, in, in today's environment, I think deserve a lot of thought. Um, Janet basically said the evidence generation system is broken. Anyone that knows me knows I completely agree with that and had a number of suggestions about what to do about it. Um, Diana talked about the importance of um, having uh, a good pathway for regulatory development that, that's agreed to ahead of time as much as possible. Um, uh, George talked about um, alter alternative forms of, um, I still can't bring myself to call it approval, I call it evaluation because most things turn out not to work that are in development. So I hope it remains evaluation and not just thinking about approval because it's important to keep bad stuff off the market too. But um, he really raised, I think, a, a very pointed um, perspective on this that's important. Um, and then Peter um, talked about the old issue of, um, uh, just for to be provocative, I would call it interfering with the market, um, stockpiling, government sticking its nose in and uh, creating winners and losers would be one way to look at it. The other way to look at it would be to say, when we have a, a market that's failing and the whole world's health could be in jeopardy, maybe it's the right time to actually do something and not wait until we have a disaster on our hands before we do it. And then uh, Denise talked about uh, collaboration across sectors, uh, easy to say, but um, hard to do. And we have some great, uh, we have a lot of great questions from the audience uh, and we got, uh, you know, you guys were so on time, we've got 40 minutes to um, discuss. So we have ample time. Uh, what I'd like to do first is just on the five big ideas, just raise one point of question and have anybody jump in and I'll sort of go in reverse. Um, Denise, you talked about collaboration. Um, I think your, your point about One Health is so important, but um, I learned when I first got nominated for FDA commissioner that there's a whole lot of people in the US who are really thinking that regulators should be kept apart from the regulated industry. And there's a term called regulatory capture, which I didn't know much about until like the first day I got over a dozen calls from reporters um, saying, how can you be commissioner? You've worked with the industry before, so you're just gonna be a show for the industry. I wonder if we could start with maybe Denise, you and Janet, just a, you know, short reflections on how to deal with regulatory capture, getting so enamored and intertwined with the industry through collaboration that you can't make, you can't say no. I think I'll start and I'll turn over to Janet, who of course has um, much more experience in this area and expertise that she's been um, dealing um, in, in, in engaging with industry for quite a long time as, as well as uh, other entities. But I would say to uh, that, Rob, that, you know, I would just say the rap regulatory capture. I think part of that is education part um, in the communication um, and highlighting the value I think in collaborating um, and having the early conversations. I think, as we mentioned today, we talked about, um, you know, through working with industry, having early communications with uh, various stakeholders, I know just kind of really helps us kind of um, identify any gaps, identify opportunities um, to fill the gaps, you know, for the benefit of, um, you know, our public health. I know that there's always been conversations about being, um, I don't know, the, appropriate way to say in bed <laughs> with industry. I, I, I don't foresee it that way. I think having early conversations, identifying issues, um, identifying opportunities to fill in the gaps, working closely together as was learned through even this pandemic and Operation Warp Speed that collectively doing so only benefits the community in which we serve. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Janet. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, Denise. Uh, also, we have uh, gotten more sophisticated on this, which is helpful. Um, early on, we simply just collaborated in any different ways. But Cedar has written um, guide rails, for example, you know, guard rails or guidelines for people who want to collaborate, especially in consortial situations or ongoing uh, uh, collaborations that help 
people understand what the lines are, they shouldn't step over. And also, if someone has been deeply involved in um, a certain program, for example, around a certain disease and done a lot of work uh, with patient groups and industry, often we'll have other people do the final evaluation of that marketing application um, to show that we do have that independence and uh, aren't, you know, both develop, working on developing something and then working on evaluating it. But it always comes up and it's a fine line. It's clear that development can't go forward efficiently without this kind of uh, four-way collaboration, academia, patients, industry, and the regulators, right? But there, could, there can be too much and there, it can be on the part of any party, the academic party, sometimes we've seen the patient groups or whatever that, who cross that line and um, get into advocacy versus uh, really trying to push the science along. So just like everything else, there's a fine line and it is true. There are people who feel um, that it's better that the regulators just remain in an ivory tower and just be, I always say, you know, like the Romans. <laughs> uh, but um, the patients don't feel that way because they realize that that slows down development and can cause a lot of um, blind alleys and detours and so forth. And they don't think, you know, they think the trade-off is worth it. So I think the best thing to do is talk about this trade-off and acknowledge it uh, and deal with it and then um, get some kind of middle ground. Yeah, I wonder if we can get just a short response from any other panelists who wants to speak, uh, speak up. And I would just point out, um, you know, in addition to One Health, among the greatly underappreciated parts of FDA, it's the value of all these meetings that occurred. You know, it was so evident to me when I was helping Janet with the user fees four, five years ago. The thing industry wanted more than anything else was more meetings. And we didn't have <laughs> meeting rooms or enough people to have all the meetings. But so many therapies that are not going to cut it get stopped earlier now because the meetings allow for exchange of information and knowledge that causes companies to focus their energy in the right place. It's just one of many examples. Um, but uh, anyone else on the panel have a comment about uh, regulatory capture? Yeah. Um, maybe, Rob, I can say something there. I, I think it's a, an example of asymmetric risk assessment. Because the concern is that the uh, the regulators will work so closely with industry that they'll be biased and won't right. make uh, you know neutral decisions. If, however, they had no experience at all with industry, then they might not even know what questions to ask, and uh, they may actually keep good drugs off off of off of the market for inappropriate reasons. So I don't think that's the solution either. And so I some middle ground obviously is the right. Right solution, uh, and I actually don't think I think it's I think those aspects of of uh, the regulatory process actually are working pretty well right now. And uh, you know, since I'm in the industry, maybe that's a biased perspective, but uh, I I don't think there's a huge need for change the way uh, the interactions are going on. Dan or, uh, or P Peter, you have a comment? I, I would uh, I think it's a good discussion. I would say that the low point was when the FDA advisory committees, um, when when there was a push to have nobody on an FDA advisory committee that had experience with industry or interactions with industry, I view that as really the, the low point in this push because uh, then you have people who, uh, to George's point, really don't have the experience that are doing the evaluation for the FDA. Obviously, there needs to be a balance here, but uh, you know, in, in my opinion, uh, the best way to do that is to have sunlight and to just uh, be very transparent about what people's uh, con potential conflicts are. And if there is a problem, then to uh, to not count on that person. Anna? I would agree. I was going to bring up that same example about the advisory committee meetings. And I would just say that, you know, bias exists in every corner. It's innate to human nature. And, and certainly FDA has their biases and can be risk adverse. And, and industry has its own biases. And academics is Janet pointed out, have their own set of motivations that, that drive behavior. And I, I, I think 
um, bringing to light the success of collaboration and where those biases um, can actually fight each other and create the tension around that, I think is where the best decisions are made. And there's always going to be a tendency to try to turn the world into a black and white, the good and the evil. But, but if we can you know, continue to collectively push for places where everyone has a seat at the table and include patient groups um, in on that when when those groups do exist um, and then champion and and tell the story of success inclusive of all of those groups and accurately depicting the roles I think that that can go a long way I, I've seen many scenarios where there's been a, a, a tremendously effective partnership but then nobody wants to acknowledge the involvement of industry because somehow then that that could be you know it could taint the story whereas I think instead we should we should kind of celebrate these these collaborations and and talk about them more yeah, I completely agree with you. I would also add, though, on the other hand, where we catch somebody not holding up to the standards of behavior, um, recognition by all parties, um, and punishment, um, uh, I think, uh, you know, will go a long way. So this has been a great discussion of the balance. So let's let's move to uh, guidance for now, because um, uh and, I, and I'll throw in advisory committees with the guidance because <laughs> actually you hit a really sore point with me because I think um, I learned uh, as commissioner that there are many times when people inside of FDA would like an advisory committee to meet, but they just don't do it because they don't see a way to get the relevant expertise on the panel given the rules. But there's also a thing called good guidance practice, which I learned about. And uh, maybe Janet, I'll, I'll uh, ask you to uh, kick it off here with your views on guidance, because I always felt like between advisory committees and FDA guidance, that, that should be like the essence of what's known about any topic of therapeutic development for any disease. And it almost ought to be continuously kept up to date because the industry depends on this. And what I've learned now that I'm in a tech company that's mostly consumer, you know, I've learned that most industries don't want any any uh, regulation. Right. And as I remember, the administration, you know, not too long ago, really put another um, hurdle that you have to overcome just to put out a guidance. I felt like it ought to go the opposite way. And by the way, this is not just a Republican issue. Um, there were there were people in the administration, I was there who were trying to slow down FDA guidance as much as possible. Um, so Janet, what should we do about FDA guidance as uh, uh, the way for industry to figure out what to do? Well, you know, when uh, two years ago, when I was head of new drugs, I uh, engaged in some reforms on guidance uh, development, and I put um, bulleted guidances out. And I think new drugs, which is mainly we're talking about here as far as drug development, and the same would be true for CBER or CDRH, has really had an explosion of getting guidance out, um, technical guidance using this abbreviated bulleted format. So part of it is simply moving away from, you know, a giant monograph telling the whole story of drug development. And it, I think it is extremely important. The thing about good guidance practices and guidance is it's a lot better than giving advice to individual companies and repeating that over and over again. It's more transparent and it also, you know, invites input from the whole community because good guidance practices say you have to put it out for comment. And so the academic community, the patients, everybody can comment on it, the industry, and then you put out a final. But what we need to do is get that cycle time down very quickly, not, you know, years. <laughs> as far as the advisory committee, I think it's pretty universally understood that the rules that we have, which are based on the Federal Advisory Committee Act and interpretations thereof, have really limited the ability of FTA to get sensible advice. Sometimes uh, we've had, we really have difficulty seating members and it has become such a struggle that, um, as you said, sometimes uh, the teams just give up and don't um, have a meeting, which is very unfortunate because of the sunlight factor and the transparency. 
hopefully uh, the center can pursue, at CEDAR can pursue some reforms uh, of widening the net of members so they could get, um, you know, people who are really knowledgeable on the committee and uh, they don't have too many conflicts. Unfortunately, though, most drug development is done by industry and if people have a lot of industry interactions, then often they're um, disallowed on the committees. And so that becomes very unfortunate. It always struck me as odd that you would think that experts in a disease would not want to have something to do with developing diagnostic or treatment approaches to that <laughs> disease. Um, but so uh, I, th I think uh, that's a good description. Uh, other, other panelists um, on the issue of guidance? Well, certainly I would, I would support uh, what Janet said, that guidance is something that everyone welcomes and uh, that if it's done in a way, and, and it provides um, information that's not on a company specific basis, which is very useful for everybody. Um, you know, this issue of uh, the advisory committees, I think really, uh, I hope will be dealt with uh, in the future. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is that, uh, and Rob, you alluded to this earlier, uh, but I think they're also, I just want to highlight an appreciation for what people who are actually in the FDA uh, are doing in terms of their sacrifices, because uh, they really are um, heroes here in terms of with really uh, low financial comp compensation dedicating their careers to helping us develop these medicines. And I think we really need to uh, take our hats off to them. Thanks, Peter. Let, um, George or Diana, would you, would you uh, like more guidance, less guidance, or are you happy with the way it is? I was, I, look, I, I would like more guidance and that, you know, it makes the rules clear and it's a level playing field for everybody. And so to the extent that you know, guidance can be developed thoughtfully and uh, appropriately, then I think it helps everybody. So I, uh, you know, especially uh, important for diseases that might be novel or where there are novel approaches, uh, where there aren't yet therapeutics on the market. And so I think uh, it makes it hard sometimes to develop drugs in the absence of guidance. And so I'm definitely in the, in the camp of, uh, of more rather than less. I would agree with that. And I would say that, you know, the FDA is in a very unique position where they get to see data from all sponsors. And so in, in, in many instances, they can be all knowing. And to the extent that, um, you know, I, I found not just guidance documents to be helpful, but also when FDA publishes their perspective on um, a specific topic or even use, does analyses um, across companies and pools data. I know those those types of things take a tremendous effort and take time and and staff is overburdened. And, and I agree with Peter that that folks who stick it out at FDA and 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 are committed are are it, it's it's really a difficult job with not a lot of visibility, but but bringing that expertise and, and highlighting it um, so that so that everyone can benefit is really important. And if that could be encouraged and, and even you know, if, if industry could contribute to creating funding for that, you know, completely uh, not directed, but just sort of to allow for scientific inquiry um, and exploration and publication, I think that would be um, really beneficial to everyone. Great. All right, so we've covered two out of our five big topics on monitoring the questions coming in from the audience. Some of them are very specific about um, decisions the FDA has made related to the pandemic. I'm going to avoid those for now, except for one that I'm going to come back to if we have time at the end. Feel free to ask them. They'll be on the record, and uh, Janet and Denise can feel free to answer um, separately if they wish to do so. But I think the purpose of this panel was really to talk about policies that could uh, change the playing field. And I, and we've got uh, 20, 20 more minutes, so I think we're in great shape thanks to your, the clarity of your answers. I want to combine um, two of them. Um, progressive approvals or adaptive approvals or whatever we want to call it. 
the idea that you should get on the market with less robust evidence um, in return for generating the evidence in the real world afterwards. I want to combine that with the broken evidence generation system. And, um, you know, hear what people think about what really would work. This certainly um, is the mantra at CDRH with devices. I think devices are a little easier in this regard, at least conceptually, because if you get a device on the market, often it needs to be tweaked in a way which is not making an entire new device, but might be something like fixing a lead or uh, changing a software algorithm inside of a device to make it better. Whereas uh, if a drug is causing a problem, um, in most cases, you gotta sort of start all over, even though uh, when we get to stockpiling, I, I, I uh, also wanna bring uh, platforms into that discussion about stockpiling, about whether the government should be supporting um, platforms uh, independently of individual treatments. Um, so let's paint a scenario where um, we say, okay, for a selected number of major problems, um, and it could be a very large number, the right way to do this is to get things out on the market more quickly with all the knowledge that we now have about science and targets and um, our ability to assess things using electronic health records and the in the uh, real world, and then let's demand rigorous evidence later. Um, and that, that would be a good trade-off. Um, some people would say, well, uh, there's been a problem with getting rigorous evidence later, it doesn't <laughs> happen, and then you can't randomize once the horse is out of the barn, so you're left with great difficulty understanding what uh, causal inference from post-market data. And I, you know, I wonder, the proposal I'd like to put out is that we need some other structure that handles the time after FDA says something can go on the market. Because even in the old scheme, I would argue that for the most part, we didn't really know what to do with the drug when it got on the market. <laughs> we just knew that the benefits outweighed the risks in certain circumstances that were enough for the FDA to say, it's in the interest of the public health to get it out there. Um, I thought PCORI might have been that entity, but PCORI has really taken on a different tact. And Janet, I know uh, you, you've been on the board of PCORI. Um, it's a vital thing to look to, to emphasize the well-being of the patient as a priority. But in this um, sort of post-market arena, we also have the recent um, HHS um, statement saying there'll be no more coverage with evidence development, something I believe will likely be reversed by the new um, administration. But we don't have a system which can reliably produce the evidence that we mm -hmm. need. I think Janet has made that point. Um, I would argue uh, right now, it's not that for lack of knowledge about what needs to be done. It's just that it's an ecosystem where no one is in charge. And so everyone is incentivized to optimize their individual part of it. And we end up with a system which is much less than the sum of its parts. So George, uh, I'll, I'll come back to you to start. You put it out there. What, how could the public have confidence that the right thing would be done in the current system that we now have once something got on the market? Well, Rob, I think you actually made the key distinction when you said there should be evaluation, not approval. Because we all know that drugs get approved with post-marketing commitments and those commitments can drag on and they're diffuse. You know, they can take years to generate. And the um, incentive for companies to follow through on those commitments is, um, let's say, not the greatest. So um, that's not what I think, that's not the solution, right? The solution is to say, we really need tens of thousands of patients to get a sufficient database to really understand how well something works. That's not gonna occur in a trial. It's just not economically feasible for companies. So let's get an adequate safety database, a few thousand patients. Let's do that in a rigorous way. And then let's provide some mechanism. For example, you could say the company would have the ability to treat 100,000 patients. And that could be done maybe in a center randomized version, uh, a 
way rather than a patient randomized way. So here are 50 centers, we're gonna make the drug available. Here are 50 match centers, they're not gonna have the drug. And after 100,000 patients, since we have the electronic medical records, we're gonna take a look at what this drug is doing in the real world. If those data are positive, then the drug would be approved. If not, it would be, uh, I mean, it wouldn't even be withdrawn because it, I don't think it would have, it should have gotten full approval. It just would be terminated in some way. So it requires the development of some in, intermediate state, which provides the ability for companies to dose a certain number of patients and get compensated for that so that the economics are, are uh, sensible. And in a way it's, you know, maybe just a different way to do what Peter was talking about where the government can pre-purchase. This would be a way for the government to say, we're going to allow private entities to purchase um, the drug up to a certain amount over a period of time before we do the final evaluation. So that's what I was, I was thinking about and one might be one way to deal with some of the issues that have to do both with efficacy and toxicity for things that uh, occur rarely in, in large populations. Now, Denise, I know that you were uh, in Office of Medical Policy and now the um, chief science person. So the, the methodology of this is right square in your domain. Are we ready for this? Do we have the methods to do this and draw the right inferences? I, I, I would say that, you know, just looking at things in a cross-cutting um, way across the agency and the different tools and um, engagements that we have, um, I believe that we do have, we can put the processes in place. I think we have the tools um, to do so. And then we have the, I, I think the dedicated um, and committed scientific force to um, be able to work together to put this in place. I was I'm, I'm just um, turning on a bit here because Dr. Caleb, I just noticed that you had a precision FDA um, uh, shirt on there. <laughs> so a little bit of <laughs> advertising there. So, you know, I just want to just kind of mention like when we're, I mean, we're right now, I mean, we're talking about something a little different here, but I, I'm thinking about opportunities that the FDA provides. And I think that if we're going to talk about like some of the collaborations and using, um, you know, databases or um, even, you know, platforms or whatever might be needed. I think um, if we think, look at mechanisms such as Precision FDA, if we even look at some of the, and then explaining Precision FDA as that secure, collaborative, um, high-performance computer platform that builds a community of um, experts around the analysis of biological uh, and data sets in order to advance precision medicine, inform regulatory uh, science, and enable improvements in health outcomes. Um, I think that 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 is related to what we're speaking of here. And there's other opportunities to do that too, as we look at Cure ID, other you know, um, and other mechanisms to kind of gather information, um, um, to put the necessary, I think, processes and uh, platforms or. Um, uh, uh, I think mechanisms in place um, to accomplish our goals as we've been speaking up here today. I don't know if Janet has anything to add to that. Yeah, well, Rob, do you want me to talk next or did you have somebody else in mind? Let me hold you till the end, because I think- Okay, because I have definite opinions on this. Yeah. You might imagine. Oh, Janet has an opinion, I'm shocked. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna preempt her either. <laughs> Peter, what, um, I mean, I remember we had many discussions about good old cardiovascular disease where you have, you know, this situation where you need these very large trials, but it's scaring people away from even investing at all. So what, what do you, what do you, I know you've thought a lot about this. What do you see as the pluses and minuses of George, uh, George's proposal? What would you look out for or do differently? Yeah, I like George's proposal. I also like your FDA uniform, Rob. Uh, <laughs> first of all, um, if we start with the present, namely what George mentioned that for many post-marketing approvals, the uh, incentives for a company to uh, accomplish them in a timely manner are uh, often not very strong. I, I, would, I would advocate for putting teeth into those post-marketing approvals and having a time restriction, for example, or to George's point, a dose restriction, 
that by the time by the following time, if you haven't accomplished the post marketing approval requirements, uh, we're gonna uh, take we're gonna stop letting you uh, sell the drug. I'd be fine with that, and the company would have to negotiate and agree to what that would be. But but I think the fact that there's a lack of teeth is a big problem in the current uh, system. With regard to George's proposal, I like it, and I think that um, if you could come up with a way to collect that data and then say based on a number of doses or a, a number of amount of time that this has to be accomplished, then that would be great. And since um, he's not on the panel, I do want to point out that you know in our email exchanges uh, with the panel before this meeting, Brooke Byers pointed out that one of the potential ways to deal with the uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, incentives for development of new antibiotics would be to ask companies to do a larger phase one trial and then uh, give them a, an, a, a, uh, uh, an evaluation or you know, uh, pre-approval, pre uh, but on the basis that they would then follow uh, what happened with those uh, antimicrobials as they're used. And again, you know, you could take George's proposal and say, "Okay, we're going to do this," but 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 that's it's for uh, ten thousand or a hundred thousand doses, and you've got to monitor the safety while you're going on. So I think there's a there's a lot of uh, uh, benefit here, but I, I would start with the current situation, which is that I think um, the post marketing approvals need some teeth. So Rob, if I can add something here, because I I uh, agree with all of that that for, this may be different for infectious diseases than for other diseases, because the translation from animal data to human data is pretty good for infectious diseases, unlike cardiovascular or CNS or other diseases. So very strong animal data covered with a, uh, combined with a really rigorous safety database, mm -hmm. I think provides adequate justification to do a larger amount of, of testing. Right. Diana, do you agree? Well, I think it. I think that's as a rule uh, true. Um, I would also say that, you know, there, the devil is always in the details with trying on these new approaches, and and um, and there are you know a lot of specifics here that could get really tricky when you're talking about the FDA endorsing and providing a an approval that would be linked with payment for a drug, which is going to be necessary if you're talking about incentivizing companies um, to something that hasn't been rigorously tested. And I, I wonder if a way around that would be to use some of these novel um, approaches instead of for an initial approval, take a drug that's already been approved and show like has been done for, you know, real world evidence that you can expand an indication successfully through the use of these um, non-traditional pathways and and get people comfortable with that methodology with that approach and then start to bring it into the brand new first indication space um, as a as a you know sort of baby step in the in the right direction all right great so janet you get the last word on this and we've got about five minutes after you finish where i want to give people um, a couple of questions with one sentence answers required so get ready okay so what, what I want to say is, number one, um, sort of I agree with some of this and I disagree with some of the others. What I think should happen uh, based on our, our COVID experience and everything that we've seen before is the U.S. ought to pay to set up in the community an evidence generation system. And that system could spend much of its time, as you said, Rob, exploring how to actually use the existing armamentarium. In other words, pragmatic trials, trying to figure out what is the best way to treat patients with the, um, with the uh, tools that we already have that are approved by the FDA, both devices, drugs, and so forth and so on. When their investigational products come along, I don't think uh, what was proposed is a good idea of this progressive approval for a variety of reasons. I'd like the idea of doing a large safety study, and then you could do a very, very large pragmatic study in this network that was already set up. That network could be partly supported by industry if it were capable of also doing those sorts of trials. And then for specific areas, if you remember, Bob Temple has already always talked about a national problem list 
of burning questions that we really need to answer. And of course, one of these is what are we going to do about antimicrobial resistance? So in those cases, I think actually Operation Warp Speed and what they did for the vaccines, for example, does provide a template. I agree with that, is um, providing de-risking investments uh, and providing funding for um, development and, and potentially scale up and for the trials for, for tools that are actually needed for national security reasons, so to speak. So people are not going to be dying of uh, infections that can't be treated. So I think those three things could go together. And the key is having a community-based, very large, pragmatic trial network. So we can randomize almost any patient in the country um, with any condition uh, to a trial and have them adequately followed. But of course, these can't be super academic, uh, very complicated uh, trials. These have to be what do you do <laughs> and what happens kind of trials, which means that safety study or other thing has to be done first. But I don't see this country with our fee-for-service and uh, the way we reimburse for medicines accepting this progressive approval model or even much of real world evidence because it leaves so many questions unanswered. And there's a tremendous need to move research out into the community that's been totally revealed by this uh, pandemic experience. So I think that would be a way forward. Janet, wouldn't you say um, it was revealed before, but this just uh, put like an enormous spotlight on what we already knew? Yeah, well, I've been, of course, um, talking about this and bringing it to people's attention for maybe 15 years. Uh, but um, because uh, each party, as you said, the system is very fragmented. Each party has their own agenda and the agendas don't align toward doing this. Uh, it requires, it's going to require tremendous leadership and a push and a vision toward moving to this. Uh, and it would require some investment on the part of the federal government. But hopefully this experience with the pandemic and the trials has sort of revealed some of the weaknesses in our system. Great. All right. We're down to three minutes. So I'm down to one question, which you should answer in one, one sentence. And then anything else you want to say in 30 seconds. The question is, have we reached a point where we need to stockpile both antibiotics and platforms for vaccines um, so that as we deal with these adaptable viruses, we are armed and ready to go as a country in the battle? And um, uh, Dan, I'll, I'll start with you. All right. Well, I, I think that um, what I would say is I would split that investment into stockpiling perhaps, but also building that infrastructure that Janet described. I think that if you think towards what's going to help us best prepare for what we do next, it's going to be having the right infrastructure um, and incentives to and capabilities to be able to quickly evaluate um, uh, drugs, vaccines, antibodies. Great. George? Yeah, I, look, I, I think it's important to begin to think about stockpiling pan-viral family reagents, whether they're vaccines or antibodies or drugs, whatever they may be, uh, SARS, MERS, COVID, all coronaviruses. We, we should have pan-coronavirus therapies, pan-flu therapies. You can pick out the five or six viral families that are most likely to uh, induce the next pandemic and begin to um, uh, proactively stockpile reagents uh, for them. Right. Yeah, I still can't figure out if we're just uh, hosts for the viruses and bacteria that actually control our destiny <laughs> or vice versa, but it's hard to know. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> I think the uh, mRNA uh, revolution is extraordinarily interesting as a potential platform for your yeah. idea. I think that the um, other vaccine modalities could have problems in that you can't reuse them. Uh, you can't take a particular adenovirus subtype and reuse it because right. uh, the person develops antibodies against that adenovirus subtype. So uh, I think we need to distinguish between the different categories of uh, the modalities for your platform idea. In terms of antimicrobials, as I said, I really think it's an upcoming crisis uh, and it really needs to have a lot more attention. Otherwise, 
we're going to be dying from very, very simple things. Uh, and it's not going to take that long for that crisis to occur. Yeah, you know, the point that you made and that Brooke uh, reemphasized in Brooke Byers in his uh, comments and said, in many cases, you don't even need a better antibiotic. Right. You just need it to have, be one that the bacteria have not been exposed to yet. And that's a strong argument for stockpiling instead of requiring what we currently require. And how to do it, that's a different question we'll take on in another on another day. Um, Denise. I know, I still think it goes back to the collaboration. I think it's the communication, collaboration, coordination and, and, and planning. Um, we just need to plan what needs to be stockpiled and build that infrastructure. And that's gonna be coming, coming through those points, the communication, collaboration and the like, and funding. That's for another topic. Yes. Thank you. Janet, any final comments? Well, I think building uh, the infrastructure for evaluation uh, applies across the board. It applies to our ordinary circumstance, where, as you point out, we don't know how to use the drugs and, and other products that we have correctly and in whom. And it applies to uh, responding to any emerging situation, because by the time you're in a crisis, what we've seen with this pandemic is not the time to build infrastructure. It takes forever and it doesn't work and it, uh, it slows everything down. So I also would put in a plug for advanced manufacturing because if we're gonna make platforms, <laughs> you know, I think the R mRNA vaccines may actually cause a revolution in vaccinology. And, uh, but there may be, there be common uh, tools and, and uh, methods and processes that could be uh, scaled up to support all that. Well, this has really been an honor to participate in this. And I am proudly wearing my Precision FDA shirt. I will, <laughs> I will say that. Uh, it's a great panel. You guys have really raised some ideas that I, I actually hope through Cersei or some other mechanism, we can actually put the arguments out there because we are entering a major policy um, window. And you, you've got to try to be optimistic in the face of all of the... Uh, views that people have about politics, et cetera. But I'm very much on board with the need to build the infrastructure now. And I think you guys have had uh, had tremendous ideas. So I uh, really appreciate the chance to participate in this and I'll turn it back over to the uh, Cersei organization. <laughs>